So, dear colleagues, good morning. I'm pleased to introduce you our today's lecture, Professor of University of Manchester, Alex Verhradsky. Many years ago, Alex graduated from the Kyiv Medical Institute. Now it is the National Bagamulets Medical University. After graduation, he began his scientific works at the Bagamolets Institute of Physiology, our alma mater. He defended his uh, PhD and then doctoral thesis. Uh, by the way, I was his first PhD student. I am proud of it. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the mid-90s, he joined the laboratory of Professor Kettinman in Berlin Buch in uh, Center for Molecular Medicine, where he started his studies of uh, glial cells. From that time, he collaborated with many, many leading laboratories in Europe and all over the world. Uh, but his uh, main place of work is the University of Manchester, right? At least uh, I'm sitting here, yeah. Yeah, but he is visiting professor in many, many leading laboratories, right? Uh, uh, he is a member of many pre prestigious academies of science, including Academia Europea. Uh, and uh, he is also a member of advisory board of our European project, Neurotwin. Uh, I should note that Alex is the most cited Ukrainian scientist. He has published about 500 scientific papers and uh, uh, scientific books in the, in the best uh, journals and uh, uh, publishers. And his works uh, have been cited more than 28,000 times. It's amazing. Alex. Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Nana. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. And of course, it's, uh, it has a special meaning every time when I do lecturing at Bogomolets because indeed it's our alma mater and it's something from which my roots came. And I'm very pleased to see Oleg Alexandrovich. Good morning, Oleg Alexandrovich. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, somehow, of course, it's all slightly unnatural and all these Zoom meetings and everything are changing our life very much. And of course, it's uh, our dream that all this craze will go away and somehow in reasonable near future, we would be able to resume our life as normal. And as less today, I'm going to talk about neurological diseases and neuropathology. And despite of all this cursed virus which goes around and which already has a toll of, I don't know, one and a half million people, still it is paling uh, comparing to other diseases which are sitting in this world, and in particular with diseases of the nervous system. Because in a sense, uh, medical science has made incredible progress, and we know now how to change hearts and joints and even livers and lungs and everything so in a sense we know how to cure many peripheral diseases and even uh, cancer which is most uh, frightening uh, disease of, of our report we already know what to do in order to cope with cancer however when it comes to the central nervous system in particular to the brain and to our cognition we have hundreds of diseases which affect it and Unfortunately, most of our uh, therapy is still symptomatic. So we can alleviate certain symptoms, but we cannot cure the disease. We don't know pathophysiology of many of those diseases, and we do not understand what actually happens to the brain and what drives all these disorders. <clears throat> and of course, the reason is very simple. The brain is an incredibly complicated machine. So indeed, if you think about it, evolution put something like 200 million billions of cells within one and a half liter of our skull. And those cells are connected with maybe hundreds of trillions of connections. And computing power of the brain is incredible. So it works in a, a petaflop or whatever, exaflop range with um, operative memory of about in you know, a petabytes range. And all that at 16 watts per hour. So if you compare it with the supercomputers, which have more or less comparable computing power, they always need a small 
uh, energy nuclear plant nearby to supply them with thousands and thousands of megawatts of energy. So when this thing works, of course, it's amazing. When it goes astray, then uh, we don't know how to amend it. <clears throat> and uh, one of the reasons of that is probably that for a long period of time, we have been looking into a wrong target. Because indeed, for the uh, last hundred of years, uh, neuropharmacology, neurology, neuropathology was mostly aimed at neurons. And now, if you look into the brain, obviously, brain is a combination of many different cells which are forming one integrative network. And roughly speaking, this ne integrative network consists of neurons, which are executive uh, arm of the brain, which are sending action potentials, which are uh, doing different things with information, processing it, and making a decision finally, which translates to muscle for forming uh, a behavior. And on top of that, we have many other cells which are supportive cells of the brain, which make all these neuronal networks working. And those are called neuroglia. And roughly speaking, neuroglia is divided into astrocytes, which are chief homeostatic cells of the brain, into oligodendrocytes and their precursors known also as ng glia, which are making myelin and supporting axons and making what is called brain connectome, and for microglia, which are uh, invaders of the brain and which are true defenders of the brain, which form innate immunity. Now, if you start to look what happens to those networks when uh, pathology comes, we will see that they behave in a very, very different way. Because when the lesion comes, what happens to neurons? Neurons become stressed, they die from time to time, sometimes they recover, but nonetheless, they cannot actively fight for preserving their environment. Because this active fighting for preserving the environment of the brain belongs to neuroglia, and that was a very, very early evolutionary step which divided the tasks, which divided tasks for information processing and gave it to neurons, and homeostatic and defensive task work was given to neuroglia. And for a long period of time, starting from uh, probably the end of 19th century, it was very clear that whenever lesion comes, there is a class of cells, neuroglial cells, which are changing their appearance. And that is response of these cells to the lesion, to the pathology, in which they are trying to do their best in order to protect the brain. And indeed, if we define a disease as a homeostatic failure, so it's inability to maintain healthy homeostasis, then obviously we have to look for the cells which are responsible for this homeostasis. And when we come to the brain, those are neuroglia. So based on a very, very primitive logic, we can say that neuroglial failure is a universal pathogenetic step in all neurological diseases. And amazingly enough, that was very much realized from the very beginning of the whole story. And Rudolf Virchow, who introduced the concept of neuroglia in 1858, in his seminal lecture, uh, which he delivered in Charité in Berlin, he said that this very interstitial tissue that is neuroglia, because for Virchow, neuroglia was a classic connective tissue, of the brain and spinal marrow is one of the most frequent seeds of morbid change. And the same was really realized by many, many neuroanatomists and neuropathologists throughout of the late 19th and early 20th century. <clears throat> so today I'm talking about one class of neuroglion cells, and those are astrocytes or astroglion. So the term is star light cells. So ketone is vessel or cell, and astro is, of course, the star. Uh, the first person who really visualized those cells was most likely Camilla Golgi, who in 1870s invented his first staining reaction, the black staining or reaction in there. Uh, staining technique, which for the first time opened the brain to, uh, to microscopy, to investigation, to morphological investigation, because that was the first real staining technique which allowed to look for the very, very tiny details of neural cells in situ in the brain tissue. And uh, when Camilla Golgi did it, it was quite a population of cells which had, as you can see here, and this is his original drawing, a sort of star-like appearance. <clears throat> More than that, Golgi realized that many of those cells were sending their processes to neighboring blood vessels, and they plastered the walls of these blood vessels with a structure which is called end foot. And Golgi was the first to realize that this end foot, or end feet when they are many, 
probably it is an interface between a brain parenchyma and blood flow, and through that, the astrocytes are, we didn't know that they are astrocytes, neuroglial cells, are able and capable to take nutrition and give it into, into neurons and brain parenchyma, collect the waste and give it back to the blood. <clears throat> and based on those images, in 1895, Michael von der who uh, was a Hungarian, but he was working at Bern at those days, in his book, he made a first definition of us <clears throat> as starlight. So, nonetheless, he had a sort of prophetic soul because in his, uh, in his paragraph, which was dedicated to these new cells, he would suggest that, that the following, I would suggest that all supporting cells in the brain, all glial cells, will be named spongiocytes and only a part, part of it would be called astrocyte. And that is indeed the case, which you are going to see very soon, because at the moment we start to look at those cells in their environment, in the brain, we see that they are not looking like star-like cells, but they are mostly looking uh, like bushes and sponges. <clears throat> so, by definition, astrocytes are homeostatic cells of the central nervous system. They exist in the brain and in the spinal cord. And they support homeostasis of the CNS at all levels of organization, starting from molecular homeostasis, because indeed they are responsible for uh, regulation of ions, for regulation of pH, for water transport, for neurotransmitters, because neurons rely on astrocytes very much in order to get precursors for many neurotransmitters, glutamate and GABA being the most illustrious. They are very much involved in cellular and network homeostasis. Uh, astrocytes are cell stem elements of the adult brain, and astrocytes are indispensable elements for synaptogenesis. Astroglial cells are involved in metabolic homeostasis through many mechanisms, including supplying neurons with energy substrate. They are part of organ homeostasis. They control uh, blood-brain barrier and they control operation of glymphatic system, which is the main clearance system of the brain as an organ. And they are even involved in systemic homeostasis because many of them are hemosensors in the brain and they can connect changes in, uh, let's say, uh, oxygen level or CO2 or uh, uh, protons or different ions into uh, various behavioral changes which are required to sustain homeostasis of those. <clears throat> Uh, they are very important for synaptic transmission, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, an essence for uh, information, information processing in the brain, because a sizable number of synapses, probably about 60% of all synapses throughout the brain and maybe about 90% of all uh, excitatory synapses are tightly covered with astroglial processes. And those astroglial processes uh, are a very unique structure. They are sort of like leaflets. They have, they're very, very thin. They have a thickness of about 100, 150 nanometers. They are completely devoid of organelles, but they are absolutely packed with uh, transporters which are maintaining homeostatic, homeostatic function of those cells. And this structure, which uh, uh, we call astroglial synaptic cradle, uh, is responsible for many, many aspects of synaptic well-being, starting from synaptogenesis and maturation of synapses, to synaptic isolation, to their maintenance, homeostasis of neurotransmitters and ions, and even for synaptic extinction, because astrocytes are tagging redundant or uh, improperly functioning synapses with different molecular cues, which are recognized by microglial processes, which are uh, moving around, and then microglia uh, removes these synapses through a process called synaptic pruning. <clears throat> Astrocytes are many. Now, they are not the most abundant cells in the brain. Uh, they are not even the most abundant glial cells in human brain. So their number uh, uh, varies between 20 to 40 percent of all glia in different parts of central nervous system. Now, in human brain, probably oligodendrocytes are the most numerous, but this is, of course, irrelevant discussion. Nonetheless, there are many, many, many different types of astrocytes and on this, on, this, on this particular table you can see how different they are and even ependymocytes which are cells with cilia and which are producing C uh, CSF, a cere cerebrospinal fluid, are, they do belong to astrocytes as a class of neural cells. How to visualize astrocytes is a big problem because we don't have a universal marker for astrocytes, especially in the healthy brain. 
The marker, which is generally believed to be universal, the glial fibrillary acidic protein, it is not. Uh, in healthy brain, probably about 20% of astrocytes express GFAP at the level of detection. And of course, GFAP is an interlaminar protein, which is part of cytoskeleton. So when you do immunostaining, you stain uh, a cytoskeleton only, and you, of course, miss the whole uh, reach of this particular cell. So many other markers are needed, uh, which include glutamine synthetase or protein S100 beta. And now even here you see when you stain with cytosolic marker like glutamine synthetase, you see a sort of halo which, uh, which, which is reflecting very many tiny astroglial processes. And if you express fluorescent markers in this particular cells, or if you perfuse these cells with fluorescent dyes, you see the true morphology of astrocytes, which again is not at all a star-like, which is very much spongy of form, so they look like a bushes, and those bushes are those tiny, tiny, tiny leaflets which are covering synapses. So in human brain, a single protoplasmic astrocytes in the cortex can cover up to two million of synapses. And of course, it's because of these tiny processes which account for 80% of surface area of astrocytes. At the same time, they take about maybe 5% of the volume of this, of, this, of this cell. So of course, it's a very, very big surface to volume ratio, which defines uh, physiology of these particular compartments. So let's stop here on the physiological part of this, of this lecture and go to uh, astrogliopathology. And this is how it looks like today, and that was changing quite, quite significantly during recent decade. So we have several types of major pathological reactions of astrocytes. First and foremost, astrocytes are cells, and whenever there is a lesion to the brain or trauma or ischemia or any, any other pathological situation like infection, for example, astrocytes can die and they do degenerate and they do die. And this process was already mentioned by Ramona Cajal many years ago. It's called plasmatodendrosis, so, uh, which is bedding of their processes. So the processes lose their integrity and astrocytes uh, uh, die, degenerate and die. The second very, very big uh, portion of astroglial pathological responses are generally known as reactive astrogliosis. So reactive astrogliosis is a response of astrocytes as well as all glial cells, which is general, in general term will be called gliosis. So reactive astrogliosis is a response of astrocytes to pathology in which astrocytes change their morphology, their biochemistry, their function in order to protect the brain. And finally, there is a huge class of diseases which is called astrocytopathies, which uh, have been uh, have received attention many, maybe probably during the last 10, 15 years, which generally can be subdivided into pathological remodeling in which astrocytes acquire some new properties which drive the disease, or it's atrophy and loss of function. And Loss of homeostatic function, of course, is incredibly important because this loss of homeostatic function leaves neurons without support. And that is a, an almost obligatory part of many, many diseases, such as, for example, toxic encephalopathies or most of psychiatric diseases. So a couple of words about reactive astrogliosis. So it comes from Greek, of course. Uh, gliosis means glia means glia, and osis is more or less a process like metamorphosis, for example. However, in Latin, this uh, suffix acquired some additional meaning of disease, so a gliosis could be considered as a glial disorder. Uh, who invented this word? Uh, I still don't know, but already in 1893, it was clear for, for Andreessen, for example, that hypertrophy of astrocytes is one of a, a real um, frequent element of neuropathology. And by 1920s, it was very much accepted that appearance of neuroglia, that these gliotic changes are an indicator of brain pathology, because indeed those cells morphologically are responding to pathology one of the first. Uh, so what it is, and uh, 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 unfortunately up to now we don't have a single agreed upon definition of reactive astrogliosis. So 
uh, for more than one and a half years. It was a big group, about 80 people, and we tried to make a consensus, and this consensus has been just accepted in Nature Neuroscience, probably will be published in half a year from now, because publication business with COVID is very much delayed. But nonetheless, reactive astragliosis is an evolutionary conserved and primary defensive response of astrocytes to pathology. When they change their biochemistry, change their physiology and everything in order to fight the, uh, in order to fight a pathological process in the brain. Uh, there are many, many, many mythology in that, and one of the most probably misleading was a recent um, uh, trend to uh, make a dichotomic division of astrocytes, of reactive astrocytes, into good and bad, A1 or A2. That is, of course, completely rejected by the community, and that was very, very much detrimental to the field, uh, generating hundreds of papers which actually didn't add anything new. <clears throat> Uh, what triggers astragliosis? Numerous, numerous, numerous factors. You can name it. So anything which is associated in one or another way with pathology, such as factors coming from the blood, for example, thrombin, or uh, factors coming through a leaking blood-brain barrier, factors coming from dying neurons, from malfunctional synapses, from microglia. All these factors are integrated by astrocytes perceived, and then it triggers astrogliotic response. And this astrogliotic response is context and disease specific. And most likely we are dealing with tens, if not hundreds of phenotypes of reactive astrocytes, which can coexist within the very same disease and even within the very same region of the brain. And when these astrocytes become reactive, they also start to send instructions. So they secrete, again, as you can see here, many, many, many different factors, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, repairing, and so on and so forth. Factors which are all generally aimed in orchestrating defensive response of the brain to uh, different types of pathology. Uh, morphologically, it is uh, subdivided into isomorphic astrogliosis, in which astroglial domain stays intact, astrocytes don't proliferate, they don't move, they become hypertrophic, and this is fully reversible. And anisomorphic, in which astrocytes move, and that usually happens in cases of trauma of the brain or a serious infectious lesions, when you need to build up a wall, and this wall is called astroglial scar. Now, of course, astroglial scar is a huge problem, for example, uh, in spinal cord injury because it prevents axons from growing. And that makes spinal cord injury untreatable disease. Nonetheless, if you look again from evolutionary perspective, this is still a defensive reaction because from evolution, spinal cord is meaningless because obviously people with spinal cord injury or animals with spinal cord injury would never produce any posterity. But nonetheless, what astrocytes do, they build a wall which protects the whole of the nervous tissue, the whole of the brain at the expense of each part. So again, it's all defensive. And what is really important, if you block astrogliosis in most of the cases, that exacerbates the disorder. Uh, pathological remodeling, as I said, that is a situation when astrocytes acquire some new properties which drive the disease. <clears throat> uh, probably the most illustrious example is Alexander disease. It's primary genetic astrogliopathology in which astrocytes express sporadically mutated glial fibrillary acidic protein GFAP. Amazingly enough, what is the result? The result is disappearance of white matter. So the pathology which is centered in astrocytes uh, translates into uh, oligodendroglial cells and which are, which are disappearing and there is no white matter and obviously uh, it's impossible to survive. Now here there is another a very good example of how difficult it is to translate everything from uh, laboratory animals to humans. So if you take these mutant GFAP genes from, from humans and express them in uh, rodents, they express them happily, but nothing happens at all. So it's impossible even by using this genetic technique to reproduce this disease in small laboratory animals. Another example of uh, remote pathological remodeling of astrocytes is hepatic encephalopathy. In which, which is connected to a liver failure, which results in uh, an increase in blood ammonium. Obviously, ammonium is also increased in the brain. And in the brain and in all our body, ammonium is detoxified with glutamine synthetase, which is expressed in the liver and in astrocytes in the brain. 
And where there is too much of ammonium, it clogs astrocytes, it stops enzymatic reaction within the cells, and it triggers a, a, a very serious remodeling of astrocytes, so they fail to be homeostatically competent cells. They downregulate expression of glutamate transporters, they have a failure in potassium homeostasis, so all that triggers uh, overexcitability and triggers a major clinical presentation of hepatic encephalopathy, which is acute psychosis. And indeed, quite often these people were driven to psychiatric ward where they happily died three days after because uh, they did, were not in need of psychiatric help, but rather of blood cleaning. <clears throat> Astroglial atrophy, and that is something which indeed uh, started to, to, to be inside of, of, of researchers only about 10 years ago. Uh, this is something which happens almost invariably in psychiatric diseases. So in psychiatric diseases, there are practically no reactivity of astrocytes or other glial cells. But what we have, we have a suffering of glia. So numbers are going down of oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, and also these cells become atrophic. Now, how to model, again, psychiatric diseases in animals? And this is task far from being trivial because obviously they live in a different conditions and they cannot tell uh, to a psychoanalytic what they feel and how they think. Uh, one of the most popular uh, things, one of the most popular techniques to produce experimental depression is uh, chronic stress. And fortunately, there is a certain symptom which is quite common to animals and to humans and which is easy to measure. And that is what is called anhedonia. Anhedonia is inability to derive pleasure. And rodents, usually they derive pleasure from sweet water. So if you have sweet water and normal water, these rodents would prefer sweet water and go to that. However, if you subject them to chronic stress, they stop liking this sweet water. And that is a very, very simple thing which we can measure and which, as I said, mimics somehow uh, a true symptoms which we observe in humans. Uh, so the chronic stress, which is leading, leading to this anhedonia and other behavioral tests, the first thing what it does, it reduces the number of GFAP positive astrocytes in the brain. In, in the cortex and the hippocampus, and it also reduces the area of these cells, so these cells become atrophic. And that was a, a very, very nice experiment done uh, many years ago by Barnes and Duman. And then they made the second step. So what they did, they killed astrocytes. So you can inject a glia toxin, which will kill astrocytes. They did so, and this killing of astrocytes by itself triggered depressive behavior. So you don't need any more chronic stress, what you need just to kill astrocytes. Now, what happens in humans? And that is what happens to GFAP positive astrocytes in white matter in severely depressed humans. Of course, this is post-mortem. And you see the number of these cells is going down by 95%. And the cells which are remaining are much smaller than cells in a healthy brain. So they are morphologically atrophic. Uh, another pathology, and this is now addiction. And again, we see the very same thing, control, cocaine, addiction, astrocytes become smaller, so they shrink. Uh, epilepsy, and epilepsy, of course, is going together with re reactive response because epilepsy, especially, uh, especially experimental epilepsy, this is acute trauma. So the cells really become reactive in a sense that they upregulate their GFAP, but if you start to look into their fine morphology, you can see here, this also becomes atrophic. So you have less processes and decreasing number of astroglial processes decreases the support for synapses and of course leads to an aberrant, an aberrant synaptic transmission. Finally, uh, schizophrenia, and this is experiments done by Mike and Nettergaard, in which they took um, cells from uh, young kids with, with schizophrenia, they made them fertile astrocytes, they, they differentiated them and then uh, grafted them into rodents' brain. And now you see a comparison, control schizophrenia, schizophrenic astrocytes made from human cells, from diseased humans are much smaller. So they are atrophic and they cannot support a normal development of the brain from the beginning. And this atrophy of astrocytes probably is one of an important factors in driving this particular pathology. Uh, now I'm going to talk about, and that is going to be the end of my talk, the last part of it, so I hope I'm still on time. And that is, of course, neurodegeneration. 
And clearly this is Alzheimer's disease of which we now have a sort of uh, an epidemic. So the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is increasing by the day. Uh, and the numbers are wide, so it's probably at least 60, 70 millions in, uh, uh, in developed countries which are noted today, and that is prognosed to increase several times in a couple of years, and so on and so forth. So that's how it all starts. This is Alois Alzheimer, who at those days was working in Frankfurt, and in 1901 he saw a patient whose name was Augusta Detter, she was 46 years old and she was very much demented. She was confused, she didn't have memories, she had false memories and so on and so forth. And Alois Alzheimer um, was, was, was observing her for coming years and she died in 1906 when he did, of course, post-mortem. And he realized that the brain of this particular patient had two uh, uh, histological, pathohistological pata markers, which are neurofibrillary tangles which are sitting inside the neurons, and the positions of beta amyloid, which are called senile tangles. Now, it has to be noted that both elements have been described before him, and that was the only first time when Alzheimer saw these two elements in the very same brain. At those days, he already was working in München under the auspices of Emil Kreppelin, and Emil Kreppelin was probably the most influential psychiatrist of uh, 19th century in, in, in the world. And he was publishing every now and then uh, a big uh, handbook, uh, a textbook on, on psychiatry. And in eighth edition of this book, he included a new disease, which he called Alzheimer's disease, which he defined as rapidly progressive, young onset, very peculiar dementia with pathology distinct from senile dementia. So very, very different from how we define this disease today. Nevertheless, uh, across the world that caused certain interest, but the number of those cases was still very, very, very low. And that is understandable because what Alzheimer actually described is a familial Alzheimer disease, which is really a very, very low incidence and which is confined to certain families which are carrying a pathological genes. Now, if you start to think about dementia and age-dependent changes in memory, there are some interesting things which I would like to share with you. <clears throat> And that is a book which uh, I found some years ago in London on the street. And this book is called Old Age. And it was published in 1889. And that was a result of a painstaking, long-lasting uh, epidemiological study of organs and systems of elderly people. So they studied all organs and systems, muscle, uh, cardio system, cardiovascular, whatever you name it. And of course, they studied the brain. And that was something which this particular book made as a best example of what is the most resilient part of our body. And that becomes the brain. So in principle, if you look into the numbers and they looked at about 900 patients out of which 74 were centenarians, only two out of 7,400 years old or older had problems with, with the memory, with dementia. And in general, Low intelligence was observed only in 11% of 900 people, and memory was good in almost 80% of them. Now, what we have today, 88% of centenarians in the Netherlands are, uh, are demented. Now, I understand that it's very, very difficult to explain and to interpret these particular results, but nonetheless, it gives certain feelings that something has happened over recent 150 years, which changed somehow the mankind existence and which triggered this uh, incredible increase in senile dementia and in problems of memory and learning in the old age. <clears throat> Uh, so neurodegenerative diseases always were looked upon from neuron-centric view, so this is a process which uh, is considered to be purely neuronal. Although from the very beginning, and this is Alzheimer by himself again, and he realized that there is a glial component, so this is his original drawings of um, pathologically uh, changed neurons, which are surrounded by these round cells, which he called glial cells, and which are most likely uh, 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 reactive microglia, 
And this is a drawing of the plug. So we have a center of the plug, which is a amyloid deposition. And that is surrounded by cells, by polymorphic cells with all these processes. And these are reactive astrocytes and probably again reactive microglia. And if you repeat this experiment today with antibodies and confocal, you'll see the same. There is going to be a core of beta amyloid surrounded by reactive astrocytes and by reactive microglial cells. Now, the main problem in Alzheimer's research is that animals don't have this disorder. In fact, animals don't have most of human disorders uh, uh, when it comes to the brain. They don't have neurodegenerative disorders. So we have to rely upon the models. There were many models. At the beginning, there were toxic models when animals were injected with certain neurotoxins, which were killing cholinergic neurons, for example, and so on and so forth. And starting probably from beginning of 2000, the genetic models of Alzheimer's disease uh, became popular. And those are indeed relying on genes isolated from familial Alzheimer's disease. And let me again remind you, familial Alzheimer's disease is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what we call Alzheimer's disease. For the time being, there are probably six or 700 families uh, registered across the world which do have this uh, inherited pathology. So these genes were isolated and the genes are uh, genes for amyloid precursor proteins, for presenolin, presenolins, which are two types of proteins sitting in the endoplasmic reticulum, and tau, which is a part of neuronal cytoskeleton. So these genes were isolated and expressed in mice in different uh, combinations, uh, and those mice dis really display certain histopathological hallmarks of the disease. So they can develop plaques and they have developed tangles and plaques and tangles and so on and so forth. And here you can see a, a brain of uh, a model with amyloidosis, which is full of black dots. And those black dots are senile plaques. So there are tons of beta amyloid produced in those brains. Unfortunately, these animals do not mimic the disease fully because they don't have massive neuronal damage. They do have certain um, problems with memory and learning and so on and so forth, but they never become completely fully demented as humans, uh, as humans do. And so uh, we have to take it with a grain of salt and we have to be very careful when we translate things from animals to humans. Nonetheless, we have to start from something and then how astrocytes look in this, in one of those models, which is called triple transgenic model, which expresses three genes and which has plaques and tangles. And if you start to look into gross morphology of astrocytes visualized in this situation with GFAP, but also with all other markers, even before the plaques are coming to hippocampus in these animals, and that happens around nine to 12 months of their age, astrocytes become smaller, they become atrophic. Now, then the plaques do, do, do arrive. And when the plaques do arrive, they send a signal around and this signal is perceived by some of astrocytes which are moving towards the plaque, which are surrounding the plaque and which become reactive. So in the hippocampi of these animals, we have two population of astrocytes, but astrocytes around the plaques which are reactive and which are trying to contain this plaque and to defend the brain and astrocytes away from the plaque, which are atrophic and which probably have compromised uh, homeostatic support. And this sort of atrophy is not specific for Alzheimer's disease, because if you start to look through other neurodegenerative diseases, you see that there are signs of the same throughout of them. So for example, Wernicke encephalopathy, which is a substrate for Corsakoff syndrome, it's a severe down regulation of astroglial glutamate transporter. So it's a loss of function of astrocytes. They are incapable to keep glutamate low, cells are dying. In Parkinson's disease, in substantia nigra, even in normal healthy conditions, the density of astrocytes is relatively low. And if we start to look into substantia nigra from Parkinson's disease sufferers, we will see that there are really atrophic astrocytes and much less astrocytes capable of producing a reactivity which probably compromises their defensive reactions. Same happens in immunodeficit virus. There are lots and lots of dying and apoptotic astrocytes. And even in amyotropic lateral sclerosis, the initial event is usually loss of function of astrocytes, which again lose their capability to contain gluten. 
Uh, astroglial astrocytes in ID, in, in, in Alzheimer's disease, in different models are failing in many, many, many things. And just an example, for example, they fail to support blood-brain barrier. And these are rather simple experiments in which uh, astrocytes are derived from different stem cells and are co-cultured with um, endothelial cells. And the resistance of endothelial barrier could be directly measured using simple uh, electronic electronic setup, so you have a couple of electrodes and you measure the resistance. And when you co-culture them with healthy cells, the resistance goes up. So healthy astrocytes increase the ability of uh, endothelial cells to produce tight junctions and therefore increase uh, as a resistivity of the barrier. When you co-cultivate them with diseased cells, that doesn't happen. And the same happens now, if you can see into expression of these different components of type junctions is the same. Healthy astrocyte keeps them up. Diseased astrocytes are incapable of increasing expression of those proteins. The mechanism probably is connected to extracellular vesicles because again, if you take a supernatant and you isolate these extracell extracellular vesicles, the result will be the same. So EVs, which are extracellular vesicles, which are secreted by diseased astrocytes are incapable of delivering something which, uh, uh, which is contained in EVs from uh, healthy astroglial cells to maintain the barrier. And exactly the same immunocytochemistry. Another very important thing is that atrophic astrocytes in the context of Alzheimer's disease, they fail to mount reactive astrogliotic response. So you remember, this is hippocampus. In hippocampus, astrocytes are surrounding the plaques and they become reactive, so they are protecting the brain. Same happens with, uh, 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 with accumulations of beta amyloid around vessels. Again, many, many reactive astrocytes which are trying to somehow seal it. Now, if you go to another parts of the brain, like prefrontal cortex or entorhinal cortex, and here the situation is completely different. These astrocytes don't care anymore about beta amyloid, so they don't become reactive. And what does it mean they don't become reactive? And these are experiments made by Miller Speckney in which they genetically deleted interlamin intermediate proteins such as GFAP and vimentin, and that actually stops astrogliotic response. So they stopped astrogliotic response in animals carrying um, uh, 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 mutant APP, so in animals which produce lots of beta amyloid, and the result was that amyloid pathology has been exacerbated. So there are more plaques, and these plaques are disseminating more rapidly throughout of the brain. So now if you start to look into the temporal progression of Alzheimer's disease, it usually starts in entorhinal cortex and goes through prefrontal cortex and then comes to a hippocampus. And that exactly coincides with ability of astrocytes to mount protective response. So in entorhinal cortex and prefrontal cortex, beta amyloid does not trigger a, a reactive a response of astrocytes. They don't defend the brain and therefore these regions are the most vulnerable. So that would be sort of a, a general idea of how astrocytes are involved in Alzheimer's disease. At the beginning, they become atrophic, they lose their support. Then when a specific lesion beta amyloid comes, they become reactive, they try to protect the brain for a while, but then eventually they stop in this particular task and astroglial paralysis paves uh, 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 the way for a final neuronal death and final dementia. Now, all that is fine and this is, no, no, do I have another five minutes? I hope. Yeah, I hope I do. Uh, it, it's it's yes, all in. You have. You have. Go ahead. And of course, it's really important because human brain is very different from the brain of rats and mice. So first of all, when it comes to, 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 to neuroglia, there is lots and lots of statements saying that there are 10 times more glia than neurons in human brain. This is completely wrong. The numbers are mostly equal, although there is lots of regional, regional differences. What is true, however, is that in evolution, we have a change in morphology of astrocytes. So again, human brain doesn't contain the largest number of astrocytes. The largest numbers are in whales and elephants, uh, which have much larger brain. But what happens in evolution, human astrocytes become larger. So here you can see it in more detail. And this is a comparison of mouse astrocyte and, a, and human astrocyte. And you see human astrocyte is really immensely larger and immensely more complex. So as 
already said human astrocyte covers about 2 million of synapses. Red astrocyte, maybe 20 to 100,000. So human protoplasmic astrocytes are very different. On top of that, human brain has specific astrocytes which are completely absent in the brains of other animals, including higher primates. And the key, key issue of these astrocytes are very, very long processes. They are called interlaminar astrocytes or varicose projections or polarized. Nonetheless, they have a very, very long processes, several millimeters in length, which are penetrating different layers of the brain. And now if you go to Alzheimer's disease, it happens that this particular type of astrocytes, which are particularly prominent in human brain, so maybe up to 10% of all astrocytes in human brain are these interlaminar astrocytes, in BRAC6 stage, which is a terminal Alzheimer's disease, they disappear completely. So how can we study the importance of these cells if animals don't even have them? Now, what happens with reactivity of astrocytes uh, according to the BRAC stage? And at the beginning, reactivity is increasing, so this is just measuring of GFAP. And it's maximal at stage 3-4. Stage 3-4 is still clinically mild cognitive impairment. Now, at the moment, we go to uh, final stages, dementia, uh, GFAP expression goes down. Uh, that's another example from familial Alzheimer's disease. These are Colombian family of familial Alzheimer's disease. It's very malignant. They die very early. And again, you see in post-mortem, astrocytes are much, much smaller. Now, finally, these are images which was made, were made by Agneta Norbert. And these are images of deprenyl signal. And deprenyl is binding to monoamine oxidase B, which are sitting in astrocytes. Now, what you see here with progression of Alzheimer's disease. We have more beta amyloid, we have more activation of astrocytes. And as long as this is huge activation, there is still mild cognitive impairment. Now this is uh, recordings from the very same patient, and there was a switch from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Now you see in dementia and ID, the signal from astrocytes goes down. So astrocytes lose their ability to protect the brain. How can we look at it? Stem cell technology, of course, and you can do whatever, whatever magic, and you can make astrocytes from fibroblasts of healthy patients, of healthy people and, and, and patients. And this is a comparison of healthy astrocytes from, made from healthy, healthy people, and astrocytes which are made from uh, fibroblasts isolated from Alzheimer's disease, either familial or sporadic. And now you see morphologically, they are much, much, much smaller. More than that, if you do from the very same stem cells, neuronal culture and astroglial cultures, you see neuronal cultures look more or less all right. Astroglial cultures are very, very much impaired. Now, can we do anything with that? And of course, it's unlikely that we ever will have a magic bullet which will stop Alzheimer's disease. Probably Alzheimer's disease is an umbrella term. But what we can do, we can change our lifestyle. And this is known from clinics that lifestyle is incredibly important for prolongation of cognitive uh, capability of cognitive aging. Dieting, caloric restriction. So if we expose animals to caloric restrictions, and now it's all about astroglial peripheral processes which are covering the synapses, what we have, and that is a long story, so it's a volume fraction, whatever it is, I'm not going to go through the details, but what we have, we have an increase in the volume and surface of peripheral processes, so we have more synaptic coverage. And this more synaptic coverage translates in a better clearance of glutamate and a better buffering of potassium. And that coincides with increase in LTP. So in a sense, when we do caloric restriction, it affects morphological plasticity of astrocytes, it increases their homeostatic reserves, and that probably positively correlates with increase in memory. Another possibility is environmental stimulation. And again, you can take these animals, control animals or animals with triple transgenic and expose them to physical activity or to enriched environment. And that improves their behavior. It improves their memory. But if you start to look precisely at an astrocyte, it also, it also rescues the atrophy of this astrocyte. So astrocytes of 
transgenic animals sub sub subjected to an, an enriched environment, they become as good and as normal as healthy ones. And in addition, that also rescues neurogenesis, which is also a function of astrocyte, which suffers incredibly with age and with Alzheimer's disease. It also affects microglia, but this is of no importance. So astrocytes are central elements for neuropathology. And of course, targeting these astrocytes is a very legitimate idea for future therapies of neurological diseases. And these are many people with whom um, I was studying glia over years. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alosha. And uh, the uh, amazing, amazing talk. We have time for questions. Please uh, raise hands here, or you can type your questions uh, in uh, chat. Uh, students, I don't know, you can type in Russian, in Ukrainian, if you Which want, I will it? translate, and Alex, understand, I hope, still. So any languages, please, questions. Uh, uh, I, I have first question. Mm -hmm. uh, Losha, I saw you published recently the paper which uh, uh, related to role of uh, astroglia or uh, I don't know maybe other type of glia in mm -hmm. COVID pathology. Can you tell us uh, what is new in, in this paper? Yeah, I mean uh, that is something which is goes very much beyond COVID. So obviously there are a possibility that uh, SARS virus infects the brain. Uh, because indeed it may affect the brain either through circumventricular organs where there is no blood-brain barrier and many cells contain uh, ACE2, which is a, a, a receptor, which is key receptor for the virus and which allows infection of these cells. And they also can go through intranasally and there is even a very wild idea that uh, remove, I mean, a disappearance of smell is a defensive reaction because olfactory neurons shut down and die and therefore prevent from viral, uh, viral infection of the olfactory bulb. Now, if looking into postmortem, there are encephalitic changes in some brains of people with, uh, with severe COVID and the numbers are anything between one to up to 20% depending on the things, but probably it's not very, very, very often happens. So I would say a, a real viral encephalitis probably would not exceed one to 2% of cases. And that is probably incredibly severe SARS where uh, patients are suffering from a, 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 a huge respiratory failure, which obviously makes, them, makes their life untenable. The second thing, which in my view is much more important, is of course hypoxia, because COVID uh, is a respiratory failure, and hypoxia. And if you if you look into into measures of, of O2, they go down very much, and hypoxia obviously affects the brain. And hypoxia by itself triggers this response of old glial cells. They try to prepare themselves to defending the brain. It's like an ischemia, like a transient ischemia. And the third thing is, of course, cytokine storm and increasing numbers of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the brain opens blood-brain barrier with all the negative consequences which may happen. And that is like systemic infection, like systemic infection in, I don't know, sepsis, if you will, yeah? uh, or uh, acute pancreatitis. So that would be very little difference between that and COVID. But Nonetheless, that, uh, is, that makes brain very, very vulnerable. And astrocytes and microglia are forming the first line of defense, which prevents all these things to happen to the brain. So in a sense, their performance is probably critical for, um, for brain uh, consequences of COVID. Now, if you start to look into uh, long-term consequences, neurological symptoms are very, very common. So 40 to 60% of patients they have neurological consequences and old patients very often have uh, psychiatric uh, like depression or even delirium and of course neurodegenerative and loss of memory symptoms so that is very very serious thing to uh, to reckon with uh, thank there, you are Lucia. there any pathologies possibly promoted by astroglia in the spinal cord uh, of course, they are. Uh, 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 unfortunately, I'm not that... Well, I mean, the, 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 the simple thing in the spinal cord, which of course is connected to glial cells, is what is called neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is a chronic pain which exceeds by far the length of the 
noxious stimuli. So, for example, it's a trauma to issues to a major nerve. And this causes neuropathic pain, pain in the, in the back, which lasts for months and years and which is debilitating and hilariously unpleasant. And that involves a very serious remodeling of both astrocytes and microglial cells. And that is in particular associated with BDNF because astrocytes are cells which are making pro-BDNF into BDNF. And the changes in that uh, actually uh, affects a chloride concentration in astrocytes in, uh, sorry, a neuronal uh, concentration of chloride in, in, in spinal cord in such a way that GABA inhibitory responses become GABA excitatory responses. And that is a positive feedback which uh, contains a neuropathic pain. So that is a clear cut physiolo pathophysiology of uh, the spinal cord. But we'll see the is, oh, there are many, and I think it's a very, very nice question. Uh, so sleep disturbances and depression and uh, neurodegeneration and Alzheimer and senile dementia are all interconnected. Now, who is first, who is second, nobody knows uh, whatsoever, and that is a usual problem of egg and chicken. Now, what sleep probably has to do with all these diseases? So you know about the existence of the so-called glymphatic system. So glymphatic system is an analog of lymphatic system of the brain, which is associated with uh, <clears throat> water transport through perivascular spaces and then water transport through aquaporins made sitting in end feet of astrocytes and which flushes more or less uh, the brain parenchyma and removes different waste products, including beta amyloid, for example. And uh, it is noted that in sleep, uh, the efficacy of this cleaning is very much increasing because the size of perivascular space is increasing very much. So sleep is very good for cleaning of the brain. Now, amazingly enough, a moderate consumption of alcohol does the same. So in a sense, uh, I would say that probably the best strategy to prolong our cognitive longevity is dieting that is good food which gives you pleasure and vitamins is a moderate consumption of alcohol it's a good sleep is social enrichment is environmental enrichment it's intellectual enrichment and some physical exercises Alek Alexandrovich wanted to ask a question sure first i uh, want uh, to uh, comment that uh, your recommendations on the life are just wonderful. I hope so. Contrary to the majority of medical advices, uh, they are ple they, they are pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Alexei, uh, yeah. could you uh, tell me, are there any recent uh, coherent or uh, sound ideas on the uh, uh, function, specific function of Essex in glia, because we now know that glia expresses as a lot of Essex. Yes, and that is a, 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 an emerging field and there is really lots and lots of expression. Uh, there are sort of, I think the mechanistic studies are still lacking, so it's all sort of descriptive studies. So I'm not aware about a single story which really links ASICS to a particular function. But it's definitely there because glial expression of ASICS is very much changing in different pathological conditions. Really so, yes? That's what people say. I mean, I don't do it. Uh, but uh, again, this is all so far descriptive. And I think you have to still take into account one thing. There are probably 300,000 groups around the world which are doing neuronal things. Yeah? There may be 2,000 which are doing glial. So in a sense, we still don't have a critical mass which will produce us all the bricks we need. So we still are far away from, let's say, characterizing a simple physiology of astrocytes or microglia across brain regions, something which for neurons was done 30 years ago. Well, the only uh, comment uh, to your explanation is that despite this number of people involved in neural research, uh, really coherent uh, 
uh, uh, uh, idea about <laughs> the role of ethics in neurons is absent as well. So I had a tiny idea that maybe the, the breakthrough will come from glial side. It's very, very possible. And again, uh, uh, I, I think probably what is happening now, we are more or less becoming in a possession of tools which allow us to selectively attack the particular types of the cells in the brain. However, with all the genetic things, we also have a huge, huge danger because, for example, the very simple example, optogenetics, yeah? So you introduce whatever channel or adoption into whatever cell type and something happens and you see behavior. And it works, no doubt about that, but it does not mean that the very same mechanism exists in the real world. So you introduce a new signaling cascade, which may interfere with existing things and which may cause behavioral changes, for example, but it doesn't exist in reality. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, do you find APC's approach promising in modeling diseases? That, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, so far it's all what we can do uh, because clearly we have to study human brain. We can study human brain with in vivo imaging, but in vivo imaging still lack quite a bit of resolution. And of course, it's very far from molecular imaging. So the only possibility would be to take stem cells and do them in culture or do organoids or do all these things with, of course, um, caveat because these are still in vitro systems and in vitro system is very, very different from in vivo system in everything, in, in morphology, in, um, in physiology, in existence of the organism as such, in existence of extra brain, uh, influences and so on and so forth, but this is probably the only way for the time being. Uh, have there been shown an RNA exchange between glial cells and neurons? And is it possible for astro glial cell to make cellular bridges between them and neurons? I have no idea about RNA, probably yes, but what is really interesting, and that is something which was found a couple of years ago, is that astrocytes are assisting neurons in dealing with their redundant mitochondria. So mitochondria from neurons with extracellular vesicles are transported to astrocytes and astrocytes do autophagy. So they kill redundant or bad or diseased mitochondrial neurons, sorry, neuronal mitochondria. It is cool, yeah, I agree. Hmm? Alyosha. Alyosha. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for a very good and interesting lecture. And I have several questions. Uh, maybe since I rather involved in studies of neurons, it is interesting for me the stability and development of this tremendous number of uh, enhancing elements of one astrocyte with many, many synapses. You mentioned that there are about two millions of uh, contacts Okay, and uh, my question is uh, how they uh, developed in development of the nervous system of particular <laughs> organism and how stable they are during the lifespan of, of the animal or human being? Well, this is a tremendously good question. And of course, when it's a very, very good question, it's rather difficult to answer it in, in, in short thing because very many things are unknown. So first of all, two millions belong to humans. Yeah? So in, in rats, it's going to be much, much less, but it's just to put it in perspective. How they develop, we don't know. We know that they are incredibly dynamic. So the synaptic coverage can change. Uh, it can change on a several minute time range. So the astroglial processes can retract and come back very, very rapidly. That can happen on days to weeks range. For example, lactation triggers a massive retraction of astroglial processes in uh, hypothalamus, which allows a big spillover of glutamate and a completely different uh, uh, work of neurosecretory cells which are producing oxytocin. So it's a very, very dynamic structure. Now, the main problem of this structure is that it's below level of detection with normal optical, optical techniques. So it's 
100 to 200 nanometers. So we can't see it. We can probably measure the signal which comes out of it, which gives us all this volume fraction and all other indirect things. Or we have to resort to EM. And EM is, of course, has its own problem. So the first problem is fixation. And because those leaflets are very, very thin and they could be long, I mean, this fixation probably may affect them much more than more bulkier structure. And second, of course, it's incredibly time consuming. So uh, I remember uh, when we still were in Berlin, uh, we were collaborating with Andreas Reichenbach, who was probably the best pleomorphologist ever. And they made a 3D reconstruction of five Bergman glial cells, and that took them five years. So this is, of course, a problem. But these are dynamic structures, and these structures are changing in lifestyle changes. They are different in different genders, so they are different, definitely under control of hormones, under control of um, general things, of white organismal things, and they are probably under control of local things. So, and change, of course, in this coverage could be rather important because the changes the whole extracellular dynamic of neurotransmitters. So it changes the volume of the cleft, the shape of the cleft, the length of neurotransmitter presence in the cleft, spillover, I mean, you name it. So it is, I think, a very, very important and clearly overlooked mechanism of uh, neuronal plasticity or synaptic plasticity. Okay, I would suggest, or maybe these works have been done, it is well known that there is a morph synaptic morphological plasticity and synaps synaptic uh, mm, uh, shape of shape and the number of uh, synaptic spines are changing on a very, very uh, fast time scale. And in my opinion, it would be interesting to see how fast they are engulfed by process of glia and it seems to me it is possible to do this how to say, with well, the current it's possible to do it but it's not easy and yes there are coming papers uh, which do show that and for example Dima Rusakov just published a sink in which they show a, a real-time changes in all this stuff so it depends very much on region so let's say in hypothalamus is much much easier because in hypothalamus it's uh, astrogleal processes are pretty big, so they're microns, so you can, you can really follow how they go. In, uh, in the cortex, it's is, is actually much more difficult to do it in a proper way, and then, of course, you need laser photo damage and blah, 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 blah. But the general idea is that probably astrogleal compartment and neuronal are complementary. So there is clear-cut homology between uh, dendritic shafts and spines and uh, branches and leaflets of astrocytes. And in my view, they certainly work together. So that is a sort of coordinated thing. And uh, the result of this coordination is synaptic plasticity. No, the, the, the second question maybe is related to the previous one. Uh, you tried to encourage us to think that, let's say, changes in uh, shape or uh, size of astroglial cells are the reasons for many, many, many uh, neurodegenerative diseases. But many works, uh, for example, Arthur Connor's works, demonstrated that there are substantial changes in neural activity, which uh, in Alzheimer disease or in model of Alzheimer disease, which uh, developed. Uh, far away from the time when uh, any morphological changes can be observed. And maybe, in my opinion, let's say there are changes, let's say, in the number of synaptic contacts, which are pure neuronal dependent. And after that, glia just reflects this and decrease the, let's say, the, the number of engulfed synapses. And in this case, mm -hmm. what you see is rather a consequence uh, than a reason for neurogenerative development. Uh, I, 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 I agree entirely with all that. And probably the first thing which I want to say is that obviously we should never consider the brain as two different parts. They are all working together. Uh, however, and that is very, very clear that there is quite a division of tasks. And the disease, so let's say all of us will have plaques, tunnels, whatever it is, by the time we are dead. 
many of us will develop dementia, many of us will not develop dementia. And this is systemic thing. So it is not dependent on a single molecule in a single region of the brain, in a single neuron or an ensemble of neurons that depends on the whole body, on the organism, on the system. And within the context of this system, what glia does is protects the brain and supports the brain. And if anything, glia is permissive for pathological development. So if you have a failure in this homeostatic support and defensive support, and the pathology will evolve faster and it will be exacerbated. And that probably is a very, very general truth which applies to any organ system or organism or even species. So a disease is a balance between pathological influences, which is exposome, which is our life, and our life, what it does, it tries to kill us, and our defensive systems, which are very many, which are uh, what is called cognitive reserve, brain reserve, compensatory reserve, and so on and so forth. And the result of this balance would be the disease. And in that context, it's really completely irrelevant at which particular place the first things start to happen. If these things are taken care of, then nothing happens. If they are permitted to proceed, we have a disorder. So it's impossible to say very good answer. First, who is second? It's, it's just, it's irrelevant. I mean, it's, it doesn't make sense. Uh, Alek Alexandrovich. Okay, I want to ask the question which seems to me uh, just, though it was generated in my brain, but it seems to me a little bit strange, but I have nothing to do. I must express, I must tell it. So, um, uh, you gave uh, one of the numbers that you gave today, uh, struck me. It was a number of neurons that are connected by uh, a given astrocytes, something like a million or, that, or, or thousand, I don't remember. But millions, yes. Well, I mean, yeah. So, so um, uh, is it? totally excluded or not that these uh, neurons that are so to say connected by with their synapses by one astrocytes astrocyte that they can be just uh, uh, that they can exchange information of some kind via this way uh, these particular ideas are entertained in the community for many years. Uh, I think it reached the climax in 1961 when uh, a, a person whose name was Richard Columbus published a paper in Proceedings of Royal Society or something, in which he said, well, there are glial cells which are giving instructions and neurons are mere executors of the instructions which are given by glial. Uh, it's very, very difficult to say. So again, first of all, there's two million synapses. There are not two million neurons, of course. So within the reach of a protoplasmic, typical protoplasmic astrocyte of gray matter in cortex of humans, within the territorial domain would be probably, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 neurons. And probably there's two millions of synapses, which are covered to a different extent by these processes of astrocytes. Now, the simplest idea would be that these processes of astrocytes are just making them separate and making them homeostatically sound. The question is whether information which is released by neurons would trigger in astroglial compartment some signal which can propagate. In principle, it's possible. And you can mimic it experimentally by very, very strong stimulation, which probably is completely non-physiological. But at least theoretically, you can create certain conditions in which you stimulate neuronal input and that will trigger propagating ionic signal in particular astrocytes. Now, the second level of integration would be, of course, a propagating calcium wave, which is 
very much hailed for glial cells and which is often observed in 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 culture but in vivo whether it exists we still don't know and there are not many really credible experiments which show physiological propagating calcium wave in vivo settings so the judgment is out i mean it's still possible so we may imagine that this is an alternative route which let's say neuronal connections would be sort of binary yeah and real connection would be sort of analog if you will uh, and you can build up the brain on these principles whether it works like that thank, thank you very much and the last question please uh alosha yeah. I, I still have one question uh, you know uh, one of our Mm -hmm. our, uh, one of our current projects is related to interaction between microglia and neurons. Mm -hmm. And we work in the very simple idea that activation of microglia results in release of some intermediate substances which can affect neuronal circuits in normal situation and especially in pathology. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I can see, it is quite possible that there is more complex interaction and maybe microglia can uh, affect let's say glial cells and after that glial cells can affect neurons do you know something about interaction between microglia and glial cells well Could you give me some I advice this is a very very that? interesting question because microglial cells are the most plastic and most active if you want cells in the brain they're moving so when we say that uh, our thoughts are moving through our brains, these are microglial cells which are moving. So their processes are in constant movement. And these processes are establishing contacts with different parts of neurons. And these contacts are very different. So for example, when it's soma, then the process of microglia comes and makes a somatic microglial junction, which lasts for a long, long time, tens of minutes, one hour. And in neuronal side, you have a specialization there. So there are a couple of mitochondria and a big cluster of ATP containing vesicles. And neuron releases this ATP very locally, and microglial cell has whatever purine receptors which are sensing this ATP. Now, if you block these purine receptors and stress the neurons, for example, ischemia, their death rate is increasing quite substantially. So this is a neuroprotective thing, but this is real, it's like a synapse. So the distance between two membranes is comparable to the cleft, it's tens of nanometers. With dendrites is similar, but it was a very, very different kinetic. They come to dendrite, stop, I mean dendrite synapse, spine, I mean, you know. They come, stop for a while, look, everything fine, goes next, goes next, goes next. If this synapse is tugged, then it stops, engulfs the synapse, eats it, goes away. And this is a physiological phagocytosis, which does not require activation of microglia. Now, I think that activation is a wrong term. I think we have to clearly distinguish. Activation happens with every cell normally every second. Yeah? So what we are talking about in pathology is reactivity. It's, it's a very different concept. And I think it's very important that semantics has to change. So with this reactive cells is a very, very different thing. But even if you interfere with this normal physiological context, that already has a consequences. So now whether microglia and astrocyte establish such a direct context, I don't know. I mean, I never seen it. There is obviously quite a bit of, uh, of humoral, uh, of, of secretory interaction. So they are secreting different factors and feeling the different factors. I cannot exclude that microglial cell would also establish contacts with astrocytes. And probably it does when it comes to, 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 to the synapse, because synapse is, synapse is postsynaptic, presynaptic. Somewhere here is astroglia, somewhere here is, is a, a, a bulb or end feed of, of microglial cell. And then what is the most interesting, at the very end of these bulbs or end feet of microglia, there are philopodia, which are moving with a second range. I mean, they go 
ground. And so it's, it's, it's another moving element which is on top of it. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Alex, uh, uh, do you have mm -hmm. time for one more question? Because sure we have do. in chat. Mm -hmm. Of course I do. May, may I ask you? Yeah. yeah? Oh, hi, Alex. Nice to see you. Yeah, and here is this wonderful lecture. Alex, very, very precisely uh, uh, question. Yeah. It was uh, claimed that GLC receptor belongs or express only in astrocytic cells. Which receptor? GLT1. Oh, yeah, GLT1, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, now it started to appear that GLT1 belongs, ex its expression belongs not for pure, for astrocytic cells, it's also especially in synaptic terminal in cultured neurons. Is it true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just a question. You know, the literature, because it's the same story with the glass, the, uh, another glutamate uh, transporter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that, that was obvious even when Dunbold was starting doing it yeah. in 93. Mm -hmm. It's all question in numbers. So you can't say that EAT1, 2 are exclusively expressed in astrocytes. Yeah. Well, well, to make yeah. The bulk is about 80% of them are expressed in astrocytes. It's up to now, yeah? It's, yeah. Up to 80%, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Uh, obviously mm -hmm. they're expressed in neurons, they're even expressed in some oligodendrocytes, mm -hmm. they're expressed mm -hmm. in some pericytes. So they're expressed anywhere, but uh, um, most of them are expressed in astrocytes, and astrocytes are bearing the grant of taking glutamate away. So that's mm -hmm. functionally, this is of course very, very important. Don't stop it, there is another very important question about d mm -hmm. I can read it. Yep, and it's very, very interesting, because d was considered to be the very first uh, bona fide, if you will, gliotransmitter, yeah? And that was, this idea was proposed by Velasquez probably in 99 or something like that. And since then, it were hundreds of papers which were looking into d as a gliotransmitter. And now everything comes back, and I'm very pleased how it's all going, because the very same group who proposed the d as gliotransmitter now comes with checking the facts, saying, well, you know what? There are no serine racemase in astrocytes. It's all neuronal. So what astrocytes do, they do not produce D-serine. They produce L-serine, which is a substrate for D-serine. So it's a shuttle. L-serine goes to neurons, neurons produce D-serine, and D-serine works as neuromodulator. And I think this is really, it's, it's a wonderful example of perseverance in science when over 30 years, you made a concept, your concept becomes incredibly popular, then you ruin this concept by your own hands in order for, in, in the sake of truth. So I think that is really, really nice. All right. This is example of uh, real, true yeah. science. Yeah. yeah. And yes, I agree. You have to be very brave to do so. So Absolutely. congratulations. And you always have to say I was wrong because yeah. we are all wrong at the end. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, so if we do not have uh, more questions, let us react. At least here we, we can clap. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, I also. Of course, uh, most important, stay safe. Nana, recover fast, please. I mean, thank you. do whatever you can in order to. to I'll stay, do. Safe, stay healthy and uh, Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. And, um, thank you. And to you. Yeah, be safe.